I would like to introduce our host for this evening, Mark Ferrari. He is an Orcas Island local. Um, he is a fantasy author and a fantasy illustrator. Um, and we are really happy to have him helping us mentor this entire season of events here for the library. Um, and we have with us a writer, Kidge Johnson. So, Mark, please take it away. Thanks, Mary, and welcome, everybody. Uh, tonight, I am very excited to be here with Kidge Johnson. Um, Kidge is an old friend and a very celebrated writer in the fantasy genre, nationally and internationally. She has taught creative writing at Louisiana State University and is currently teaching the same at University of Kansas, where she is also an associate director at the Center for the Study of Science Fiction. She has been a managing editor for Tor Books and Dark Horse Comics. Uh, she has been editor and creative director for Wizards of the Coast, uh, some people from which we will be hearing from next Thursday evening. Um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, the makers of Dungeons and Dragons and Magic, The Gathering. Um, she's been a managing editor uh, and user communications in, for user communications at Real Networks and content manager for Microsoft Reader. Um, her work has been translated for European audiences and other languages, including Japanese, Turkish, and Icelandic. Uh, just to give you some idea of how accomplished she is, Kidge is a three-time Nebula Award winner, a three-time World Fantasy Award winner, and a Hugo winner and finalist, uh, along with uh, a William L. Crawford Award, a Theater Sturgeon Memorial Award, a James Tiptree Jr. Literary Award, and others. Uh, the, the first six or seven of those awards are basically the equivalent of the Academy Awards, uh, the, uh, the Golden Globes uh, of fantasy and uh, genre writing. So uh, she is a very accomplished person with an incredible black backlog of experience. And last week, I spoke with you all about the general idea that storytelling is both more pervasively present and more significantly functional in virtually all of our daily lives than we often think it is. I tied that only very briefly into the specific genre of fantasy fiction. Tonight, Kidge is going to be delving entirely into the subject of fantasy fiction and really focusing on what that means and why it matters. So Kidge, um, welcome. Thank you for joining Thank you. us tonight. And is Thanks. there anything you would like to say about yourself or to help uh, introduce yourself better before we start going? I think that sounds pretty good so far. Um, I guess my entire life has been a series of um, experiences where I've been collecting information so that I can actually talk about how fantasy fits into the niche of literature, how literature fits into the niche of reality. So this is actually um, a really interesting topic and it's one I've never addressed in quite this way. So I'm actually really looking forward to this. Well, great. All right, well, let's start addressing things then. So here's my first <laughs> question to you. <laughs> How do you see the difference between fiction and nonfiction, we, literarily or otherwise? Yeah, we started with this because, um, hi everybody, by the way, I know many of your names as I saw you showing up. Um, uh, Mark and I talked for just a little bit about this earlier this week to get an idea of what we wanted to talk about. And I kind of wanted to start by talking about the difference between fiction and nonfiction because I feel like it's a pretty good starting point for talking about the differences between fantasy and realism. And I'll be using my hands a lot, so. Um, so uh, and the example I give is sculptures of elephants, that um, fiction takes a big pile of clay and you start putting pieces onto a shape, onto an armature, until you have something that looks like an elephant. Um, fiction is an accretive act. It's a, a, a cumulative act, an additive act. Um, Nonfiction is a subtractive act that if you want to make an elephant out of marble, you start with a big chunk of marble and you start, like that saying is, you carve away all the pieces that aren't an elephant and you're left with that. Um, 
so nonfiction, in fiction, we start with nothing except our imaginations and those parts of what we can experience or, or, um, or know what has been experienced, and we accrete them to create a, a truth. And nonfiction, I have all the data points of my entire life, for instance, if I want to write a memoir. And it's just a matter of which pieces I carve off that marble that makes the difference between an elephant and a house. Um, I will make different decisions about creating a nonfiction memoir um, based on whether it's a comedy, whether I want it to end happily, whether I want it to be about a theme or a different theme, which where I would make different choices. So I kind of wanted to start by talking about just that, the notion that fiction is all the way over here as something that we start from nothing except a pile of clay and a personal vision of how we are gonna turn that into something. And nonfiction is over here where we start with a, a pile of very personal information and we, or historical research, which is also personal research. And we start carving things away. And in both cases, the materials that we start with um, are capable of becoming anything. But in one case, you are starting with nothing and building. In one case, you're starting with everything and subtracting. Does that Great. make sense so far? I okay. think so. What I hear okay. you saying basically is that in nonfiction, we start with everything and narrow it down to what we're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Whereas with fiction, we start with nothing but imagination and avoid a kind of infinite potential and build something there out of pure imagination rather than scooping things out until we're boiled down to something. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's why this is sort of relevant for talking about fantasy. Um, there's a lot of really good theorists about fantasy literature who are out there thinking about what makes fantasy uh, work, what makes it real, what makes it fantasy, what makes it important. So there's some people asking really, really good questions. And one of the very, very best of them is a man named Brian Atterbury, which is A-T-T-E-B-E-R-Y. And he wrote a book that his introduction is just fantastic. And he points out that, um, and he's probably drawing this from someone else, um, that way off to one side, uh, that all creative endeavor, all literature, let's just say, because we're going to stay focused, all literature exists in a gray zone that is between two poles. And the one pole is um, reality as it's experienced, or rather, even more accurately, experience, personal experience. Over here are the things that have happened to me or I have done as I have perceived them. All the way to the other side is um, what we might call fantasy, but because we're gonna talk about fantasy as a genre as well, I think we're gonna call it the imagination or the, the imagined. So all the way over here is sort of the protean stuff of dreams and illusions and daydreaming and myth. All of that's way, way over there. And it's a very personal experience. If any of you have ever tried to explain a dream, you know exactly how personal, how hard it is to try to explain what's going on. Over here is your experience. And that also is almost impossible to make clear. I can tell you how, what I did today, but I cannot actually introduce you to the interiority of that, of what I did without starting to muddy the two. So if I stay closely over here in reality, realism, um, I'll end up uh, sort of, I have to start applying imagination to get us to a place where you can see what I'm, I, where I've sorted out my experiences of the day so I can tell you why today was important. And all the way over here, I have to apply some realism because if I just try to tell you about a dream, you still, you need to know what's in a kitchen. You need details for it to start to become real to you. And so all of literature happens through a series of, of uh, sort of negotiations between the protean imagination and the experience, you know, the experienced existence. Um, we would tend to think that you could run all of your literature on a line between those two poles. And that over here is the personal experienced reality. And just the side of it is me creating already a, a, a applying craft and imagination to create a narrative about my day that you then will understand. And as we keep moving along that 
that continuum, I, we start to add more and more imagination. It starts to look more like fiction. It starts to look more like nonfiction first, but then it starts to look more like fiction. And then the general understanding is that as we move through fiction at, towards that sort of mythic place, we are moving more towards fantasy. Now that's actually not 100% accurate, but it's kind of an interesting place to start. And that's sort of why I'm starting. If you think the, the protean experience of the unknown, unreal, irreal, we would say I-R-R-E-A-L, the irreal thing, and the, the very personal and untranslatable experience of being a self. They both overlap, but they overlap sort of in the back somewhere. Um, in the middle where we create art, um, that's where we're making decisions pointing towards more of one or the other of these. So in this, in this distinction between the, uh, the subtractive uh, process of nonfiction and the additive process of fiction, uh, one of the things that I suggested last week was that the value of storytelling, and, and by that I pretty much meant fiction, uh, the advantage, uh, one of the uh, advantages of storytelling was that it was inventive, that it was creative, that rather than simply finding something that already exists out in the world and making more sense of it or finding some clever new way to use it, we were literally creating things that had never been and were not out there to find, thereby introducing ideas or possibilities into the world that could be developed into real world nonfiction things someday. So when you're building an elephant, you can build what isn't there. When you are carving an elephant away from what's already there, no matter what you come up with is going to be confined largely to what it, was already there. It can be, it really can't be much bigger than the block you made it out of. Right. So I could, uh, for instance, decide to write uh, a memoir about myself and I'm gonna stay as close to my experience as I possibly can. But while I can add things like, here's what's going on in the town I grew up in, here's what's going on in the country, here's what's going on, I, I can, put all of this stuff in that was not my actual experience. For instance, when I was six, I didn't know who president was, but there was one. Um, but the real experience, by doing that, I'm already starting to expand outside the restrictions of the block of marble that is my life as it was experienced. So yeah, exactly. Um, the, I like to think of those two poles as the imagined and the experienced. and. Uh, certainly, the, it's a truism, and we're not talking about science fiction, but it's a truism in science fiction that science fiction writers invent things. We imagine things, and then some scientist goes out and makes it. And there are enough data points of instances where that's true. People kept, present that argument a lot for the relevance of science fiction. But it sort of defeats the purpose that we don't invent. We just we throw pasta at the wall and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't. And fantasy, of course, it's quite different. Fantasy doesn't generally invent things the same way. Um, one definition of fantasy uh, in comparison to science fiction is that science fiction is stuff that could happen and fantasy is stuff that can't. Um, you can further detail this and say realism, realistic fictions, are fictions of stuff that could happen or could have happened and science fiction is stuff that could happen in the future or could have happened in an alternate timeline. And then fantasy remains the stuff that can happen. It's, that's the land of dragons. It's also the land of vampires. It's also the land of, of uh, you know, gravity suddenly changing because you feel happy that day or, or like a James Thurber story where somebody has no gravity to them. So we're not creating things that are functional, we're, but we are doing something that's pretty significant, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Right, and not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I kind of want to throw in here, the fact that fantasy dwells especially in things that can't happen, quote unquote, in our world, does not mean that, that, that fantasy has nothing to say about all the things that can and do happen in our lives and who we actually are. Um, in other words, the value of fantasy has to do with what we learn about ourselves in what I think you called thought experiments when you and I talked. Later, yeah, we were talking about thought experiments, which is um, one of the things, uh, especially when I'm talking about science fiction and just 
just to get it out there, science fiction, uh, the argue, there are arguments that science fiction is a category of fantasy and arguments that fantasy is a category of science fiction. But, and I actually think they both miss the point. I think science fiction is a realist fiction. It's just about fictions that have not happened. Um, and fantasy sometimes is a realist fiction, but sometimes is, is a fiction that is based in myth. And that's why we have two strong voices in fantasy. We have um, the mythic voice, once upon a time, you know, that the sort of lyrical voice that we see in Borges and people like that. And all the way over here, we have very, very realistic, crunchy, you know, just like our world, except it's got dragons and um, swords fantasy. Right. And that's, it, uh, it has more in common with the historical novel than it does with the fiction all the way over here with Kelly Link. And in terms of that same continuum between fantasy and science fiction and uh, literary fiction and nonfiction, uh, um, I, uh, I also observed when uh, we were talking the other day that human beings in the real world today do virtually everything that only elves did in the fairy tales a thousand to five hundred years ago. That fairy tales started out describing all sorts of things that couldn't happen in the real world and now virtually all of them do, which puts fiction, which puts fantasy fiction, I don't know where, ultimately. Well, I would fail. argue, we didn't talk about this, but I would argue, having thought about it, that, um, that uh, what you're talking about is actually um, superhero stories that we are we are able to do things that a superhero would have been able to do if invented a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, a superhero would have been able to fly faster than sound, would have been able to do all of these amazing things. And technology is our superpower. That's how we are allowed to do it. Elves, we, I would argue we don't actually, there's a lot of things we don't do that elves do. Most notably, we, we, don't live a thousand years. You know, elves are a big, big shaggy field. And um, there are a lot of things that they tell us about ourselves, but the things they tell us about ourselves are not, this is what you would do if you just had more blank. They're, but they're meant to be alien to us. They're meant to be strange and yet resonant to us. Right. And whether they're really small or really, really tall, whether they're brownies or they're, you know, uh, um, like uh, Tolkien's uh, elves, they're they're not they're not like us, and that's part of finding the the similarities and the differences is part of the tension and interest in fantasy. Fantasy, I would argue, and you know, we'll talk about talk about this probably in a minute, but fantasy, I would argue, is all about um, trying to make sense of the unsensible the thing we don't understand. Um, it has its roots very deeply in myth, which is uh, an attempt to, to make sense of the world. Why do we have rain? Why do we have death? Here's a myth that explains it. But it's also um, the same curiosity that puts, uh, creates the far traveling narratives of uh, like the Greeks, the Romans, and then you know through the Middle Ages. The idea that you can go to a foreign land and see a camel and a camel, that's not a real animal until you've actually seen it. So some travel writer in the you know, first century AD goes and sees a camel and comes back and says, there are these things and they have humps and they can walk for a thousand days across the desert. Um, there are also these things and they, they have blue skin and they will grant your wishes, but they will take your soul. You know, it's like the difference between... Um, a creature that was actual but not observed, that was not part of the experienced reality of the character, um, and a, a creature that was a fabrication um, is, is actually to the person reading that book, there's no difference. They're both fantasies. They're both would you, fantasies. Would you say then that old fairy tales were the superhero stories of their time? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would not say that, although plenty of them have many of the tools, use many of the same tools that superhero stories do. Um, they have clever people who are managing to solve problems. They have seven league books. They have super technologies. You know, the booth that you can walk seven leagues in a single step. You have flutes that will, you know, summon rats to you. So they're full of you know, magical implements. And as Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction writer has said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 
which was the what, which was the point I was getting at earlier. Yeah, I mean and the different the difference between a supersonic jet and seven league boots boots seems minor to me. The uh, the difference between the ability to communicate instantly to some place far away in a magic mirror and the ability to pick up an iPhone seems minor. So there right. are I think, a lot of things we do now that were once impossible things in fairy tales. But right. the, reason I the reason I asked about whether they were the superheroes of the past is 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 uh, anticipating an, a question later on here about where all of this fits into the ongoing evolution of literature and what is what is nonfiction and what is fiction and what is literary fiction and what is non-literary fiction from year to year and century to century and millennium to millennium over the course of history vis-a-vis uh, -vis wherever we are right now. Yeah, if, if only there were an easy answer to that, but I did, I did sort of put together a kind of loose timeline of how we got to here. Um, this is something that we oh, love. That's question number four. Can you it hold is that? in fact, I can. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we're actually partway into question number two already. Question number two that we came up with the other day was, how do you see the difference between fantasy fiction and other kinds of fiction? So you've mm -hmm. already started addressing this, but is there more you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I mean, there, uh, <laughs> a lot of this points to some stuff that, we'll, that we will talk about when I talk a bit about where fantasy comes from. But, um, but I think that one of the uh, a difference is um, whether or not it's, a, it's plausible. Um, I, I wrote this down because it was like such an interesting distinction to me. The difference between the, uh, something that is plausible, um, which is uh, realism. It's plausible that I can get in a car and drive someplace. It's plausible that the sun will come up. I mean, it's more than plausible, but it's plausible. Um, uh, and stuff that is improbable, um, stuff that is exciting. And I, I wrote it down and now I can't find it, but I'm sure I'll see it at some point as I like look at these notes because I took notes. Um, but uh, the idea that um, uh, some fictions are, are trying to stay as close as they can to the pole of experience. Um, some are willing and have to, in fact, push more towards the other pole, the pole of the protean imagination, of surprise, of Im improbability, of, of impossibility, in fact. Um, realist fiction, but also a lot of other fictions, are pretty close to the place where if people get hungry, they eat. If, as opposed to over here, if people get hungry, they grow roots, or if people get hungry, they turn green, or if people get hungry, they devour their young. You know, it's a lot of different places you can go as you move away from the experienced reality into inexperienced realities, um, into imagined realities. So I guess one of the things is that, one of my arguments is that all of these fictions are on a continuum. And in fact, most writers, and certainly up until the modernist age, most writers wrote both. Um, they didn't necessarily draw a clear distinction. In fact, for most history, they, they didn't see any need for a clear distinction. Um, that really starts with the Gothics, um, which, uh, um, which, which is sort of the place, the moment at which uh, David Sandner, who's like a, a fantasy theorist, argues that's the moment that science fiction or that fantasy and literature uh, mainstream literature simultaneously created each other by defining each of themselves as what the other one was not. So until then, there was just stories. There was just literature. After that, now literature starts to d draw distinctions and say, well, fantasy is the thing that's not realist. Realism is the thing that's not fantasy. Right. So, um, so we're, we're already on to question four here, sort of again, about the origins and history of fantasy. Um, I think maybe we could just go there. We're uh, just gonna go there, yeah. Yeah, let's so just go there. We can come so, back and talk earlier or so about our it's third easy, It's easy to believe that, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's easy to believe that fantasy started with Harry Potter or maybe with Lord of the Rings, probably more accurately, that this is some modern invention 
a modern invention for a small group of people that's interested in that sort of thing. But you seem to be suggesting that what we call, what we what we call fantasy literature actually has roots that go much further back than that. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us some of what you away. know about the <laughs> origins of this kind of literature? Well, I think the first thing to do is to uh, point out one of the reasons why there's so much imprecision here. Um, it's because, uh, again, uh, Brian Atterbury talks about this. Um, we use the term fantasy interchangeably to mean either the fantastic mode, which is what I've been talking about before this, you know, the notion that there are things that are irreal, and yet I'm going to use the language of experience to try to convey them to you. So that's the mode of fantasy. Um, I, Clear over here is what's called the toolbox. This is a different ruler, everybody. Um, over um, to the other side is the toolbox of fantasy, which is what when many people talk about fantasy, they're thinking about. If I were to like put up a quick poll and say, what is fantasy to you? The answers would be elves, dragons, swords, um, medieval setting, uh, you know, uh, 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 Campbellian quest myth, you know, all of these, these things which are not essential to fantasy, but are considered the toolbox, and a toolbox which anybody can dip into at any time, and they do. Um, in the middle is the genre of fantasy, and that, that is actually sort of a combination of, it's sort of a marketing category. It's been one argument that theorists make is that fantasy didn't exist until after Lord of the Rings. In fact, it did not exist until the 1970s when um, one editor decided to uh, hire somebody to write a book as much like Lord of the Rings as she could be, it could be. That was The Sword of Shannara by Terry Brooks. And it was meant to be just a direct lift. This was, the editor's name was Judy Lynn Del Rey. And when she was interrogated about this as an idea, she said, everybody who loves Lord of the Rings has read it all the times. I can't sell them any more copies of Lord of the Rings, but I can sell them copies of something that looks like Lord of the Rings. And that was the start of the epic fantasy boom, uh, which is, I think, responsible for much of the sort of bad press about fantasy. Because if you go back even to like the 1930s and 1940s, you would see fantasy in Saturday Review, the Atlantic Monthly, Harper's. You'd see it in the New Yorker. You'd see it in all of these like, the magazines that we think of as the bastions of high literature, um, you'd see fantasy, like fantasy with the elves. We're not even talking, you know, weird, like, you know, liminal stuff. We're talking about fantasies with elves and, you know, uh, you know, fairies being, uh, children being taken under the hill to live with the fairies. Um, and made to, the books that were being sold in the, the stores were, uh, were also, they were not separated. They were, there was a sense of, category between light novels, which included things like historical novels and serious novels, which included things like Sinclair Lewis's The Jungle. Nobody would mistake The Jungle for a piece of humorous writing the way you would think of like uh, Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. So, so that, that three, those three layers, the, the mode, genre, slash marketing category, and toolbox are actually relevant to talking about the history of fantasy. Because his fantasy as a mode goes all the way back. Um, you can, even if you set aside uh, narratives of divinity, um, saint stories, biblical stories, stories, you know, religious tales, there were many, many stories that were fantasy adventures, things that were not within the experience of the people who were writing these stories or telling these stories, but were nevertheless um, worth telling about. So you get events in Gilgamesh that can't happen. You get events in Ecclesiastes that can't happen. You get um, events all the way through, like so much Greek literature that are impossible. Some of them just flat crazy impossible, like turning into an ass because of, you know, you've, you've irritated a god. Um, and some of them are less impossible. Um, so we start out with that. We start with the notion that the mode of fantasy was just endemic to everything. And we moved effortlessly in works of literature between um, Venus says this, and there's some discussion about whether or not you could say like a Greek mythological narrative 
is religious or whether they were using Venus or using their, um, that's actually Latin, but, but using their gods um, as tools for telling stories. Um, but, but they were clearly in some cases, they're using their gods as craft tools. They're being used for reasons other than religious worship. And uh, we get into uh, things like the Iliad and there's God activity or irreal activities all the way through it. Monsters. Monsters well, everywhere. Monsters. Go to the Odyssey. Yeah. It's packed full of monsters. Mm -hmm. um, and another sort of second thread is the far traveling narratives that I was talking about a minute ago. Um, you can't tell the difference between uh, the way people in far cafe might be from the way made up people might be. And so far traveling was an attempt, a reader of a far traveling narrative or the listener of one was, was being exposed to a lot of things they would never imagine. And most far traveling narratives, that's what they really lean in on too is, and, and here's a place where smoke rises from the ground. Here's a place where the ice never melts. Here's a place where rivers of, you know, fire run down to the sea. And all of this, those are, those are being told they, they may or may not be real things, but they, but they are perceived the same way either way. And, and it's a really easy step to go from talking about, you know, uh, Iceland and the, the geyser, geysers of Iceland and a trip to the moon. It's not mm -hmm. actually that different. So far traveling then becomes this place where we can explore all these mythic places. Um, a third strain is the sort of romance narratives. We get Arthur, we get the matter of France, we get um, these, these chivalric tales where again, monsters. And these stories, the, the chivalric tales especially start to turn into what we think of as fairyland stories in a way that myth does not generally, and even in a way that travel writing does not. So, although there's usually plenty of traveling in those things. Um, all through that sort of middle ages and into the early modern period, people are writing both interchangeably from one chapter to the next. Chaucer writes talking chickens and then Chaucer writes, you know, a sex farce. And uh, Chaucer writes things that are meant to be taken uh, allegorically and then Chaucer writes something that is just flat, unreal and impossible to interpret as anything but itself. Um, you get into the 17th century um, and things are starting to, um, as the skills of the writers to, to tell stories in ways that we recognize, um, you know, with dialogue, with scenes, with um, all of the things that we think are generally part of a story, we see, um, uh, we see writers do going, again, going back and forth seamlessly between them, but they are, they are more aware of the differences. Um, you have like Defoe, who wrote one of the most naturalist novels there is, which is um, Journal of the Plague Year, although it's pretty stylish in very interesting ways. He also wrote a book about traveling to the moon called The Consolidator. Um, uh, you have uh, Margaret Cavendish in the 17th century writing about, uh, she writes The Blazing World, which is the most amazing fantasy you'll ever read. Um, she also wrote science writing. Um, everything then, the Gothics start building in the late 18th century, and the Gothics were written in this very strange, elevated, macabre kind of way. The Gothic is a topic all its own. And people are starting to feel uncomfortable um, because the Gothic tended to be over the top. Originally, it was presented as though it was historical. You know, this, this horrible thing happens in 12th century Spain. It didn't really happen here, you know, but it was Spain. Um, and in the early 18th century, this guy Addison wrote an essay where he basically said, there's a difference. He described what he called the fairy way of writing in quotes, the fairy way of writing. And the fairy way of writing was him attempting to assign a style to unreal literatures. So he's like, the fairy way of writing is elevated language and it should be pretty and it should be full of strange images and all of this stuff. And uh, the fairy way of writing only exists in contrast to the realist way of writing, which is about real people having everyday problems. That's where the real divorce starts. Um, Gothic literature continues to do its own thing, but the 19th century, which is when 
fantasy starts to be defined as the stuff kids read. Um, so I think it's interesting. This is also the same period that childhood is a construct. The idea that we should have innocent childhoods be, was a social construct that comes largely out of the Victorian era, the 19th century. Um, so all through the 19th century, we see the seeds planted for these, for what then happens you know, towards the very end of it, and then came to its full flowering in the 20th century, which is the idea fiction should only be about what's real. The real world is hard enough, weird enough, crazy enough. Um, it's like if you are not writing about what it is to be in the here, the now, and attempting to engage with that, then you're doing it wrong. You're, you should be writing about that. And if you're doing anything else, you are indulging yourself in writing for children. Um, there were still plenty of people who were writing fantasy, um, they, and they, but they were writing a kind of fantasy. They weren't writing heroic fantasies, but they tended to, be, and they tended to be considered light writers. Um, so John Collier writes is one of the best writers of the 1930s uh, of them all, but he was a light writer because his content was not serious. He was not writing real literature. And then we get to Tolkien and that's when everything changes. As I said, Tolkien was very popular and then Tolkien became the founder for the, the inspiration for the genre of fantasy. And so for the next 20 or 30 years, all of fantasy was trying to get on that sweet gravy train by imitating the same stuff. And because this is the way all marketing categories work, and that includes literary fiction. Um, everybody tries to jump on that, that, that wagon. Um, that wagon gets overloaded and stale. People get sick of it, start bad-mouthing it, and abandon it for a different wagon. And so since then, we've seen a number of movements, the urban fantasy movement. We've seen a whole lot of different sort of things come up. And, but again, if they're successful, everybody jumps on that wagon, and they kill it dead. Um, and that's true across mysteries. Um, how many counted cross-stitch mysteries are there in this world? Um, or you know, the cozy mystery became, is, is a pretty well-laden wagon at this point, for example. Um, and that probably is like the quick and dirty introduction to how fantasy became the thing it is. Um, we're starting so, to see that change. So to recap sort of in a nutshell before we move on, there is the mode of fantasy that has been here since storytelling began, basically. All of the sort of mythological, creative, imaginary spaces that, that appear and disappear in all kinds of literature, from Gilgamesh and Beowulf to Shakespeare when he's writing The Tempest or Midsummer's Night's Dream and filling them with fairies and magic and wizards, even though there are also plays about real nobility and real Europe and all the rest of this. Um, you know, on through all of this, all of this era before literature was divided into genre labels. And then there's the genre of fantasy, which is actually a marketing invention, if I understand you correctly, that started with the Gothic and accelerated from there to the point where pretty soon there was a kind of a artificial and belatedly imposed category projected onto certain elements of what had used to be general fantasy. Uh, literary fiction. Yes. And now suddenly became a ghetto of its own. Um, yes. And then there's the toolbox that you mentioned, which is really just the props of that space. It's not mm -hmm. the story. It's not the message. It's not the value or the meaning. It's literally just the props of that space, the swords and the pointy wizard's hats and the bright blue lighting effects that go with a magic spell. Those things are no more the story than the the tutus are the ballet yes um, yes right. exactly okay. and actually that's a pretty good when you bring it up like that that actually makes makes a good point which is that the toolbox was in existence and even acknowledged um maybe not directly long before the marketing category so um you know uh, a lot of people were writing voyage to the moon stories for instance we usually consider those science fiction but they they're they're operant in this case as well. And Voyage to the Moon stories had all the same pieces. You had to get there somehow, usually using either a technology or, you know, rubbery magic. Um, you met people there and you learned about their culture there. 
Often you waged war there or war was waged on you while you were there. Um, sometimes you came back with something that was valuable. Um, these are all things that we see in every space colonization narrative ever. Um, and it's also, so that's part of that toolbox. And uh, it was being used long before science fiction as such uh, was, would have been long before the term science fiction. And most people would argue long before the founding of science fiction. Right. Now, of course, we keep talking about science fiction. There are distinctions between science fiction and fantasy, right? Yeah, there are. Well, there are. Um, but generally, again, this is the reason, one of the reasons why fantasy and science fiction are always in the same marketing, in the same shelves. That's why we talk about science fiction and fantasy with the same voice. Um, there, there are historical reasons to do with publication and promotion that put them both into the same place. And there were overlaps. There, there certainly overlaps of who wrote them because they were both light literatures in the pulp, you know, when pulp fiction was, was uh, really coming into its flourishing. So people would write both science fiction and fantasy, often in, in ways that are almost identical. So their fantasies set on a strange planet, planet look just like their science fiction, which is set on Mars. So, I mean, I ask some of these questions just by way of kind of uh, opening up the question of what people imagine when they hear the phrase fantasy fiction. Um, you know, do they imagine fantasy fiction or do they actually imagine a science fiction novel they read somewhere? And do they imagine the best of science fiction? I mean, sorry, the best of fantasy that's out there? Or are they imagining sort of Shannara or something else that was pretty much purely <laughs> about the toolbox? You know, so this leads us to the, the next question we had come up with, which is, you know, so once you have this, this sort of ghettoized label of genre label of fantasy being applied to literature containing certain kinds of material or literature operating within a certain mythical imaginary creative space, uh, the question becomes, what does that mean? Are mm -hmm. all is all fantasy literature, now that it's been ghettoized, is, all, is everything in that ghetto the same or are there different kinds of fantasy literature and are there different qualities of fantasy literature? Yeah. I'll also remind you that you mentioned Farrah Mendelssohn and her categories the other day, if you remember that. Yeah, so yeah. So might be a place to go into some of that. It would. I'm gonna start with, the, with, with what you said about quality though. And I think that that's really, really an important thing to think of because, um, because uh, another, yet another way to visualize this is based on Scott McCloud, who is a comic theorist, comic book artist and theorist who wrote a book called Understanding Comics. And he talked to, he's talking, he's making the argument for the validity of comics. And he says, people have very little respect for comics because they're like, it's that terribly drawn, terribly colored, cheesy, stupid stuff with, you know, people in gaudy outfits, you know, engaging in, you know, uh, a hero narrative, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, it's, it's shoddy in its, its very character. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. adolescent, just, you know, gim crackery. Um, right. His argument is that, in fact, comics is a container that contains anything you want to put into it. Um, we see that with Mouse. We see that with, um, there's a French comic called The History of Sex, which is actually a nonfiction work about how reproduction works. Um, Before there, you go on Mouse, we, we've been throwing out a lot of names and titles here that probably don't mean anything to a lot of our audience. What's Mouse about? It's about... Mouse is uh, uh, talking animals. To, um, it's it's uh, uh, Spiegelman, the, the author, talking about his father. Um, who had been in the Holocaust, had been in a concentration camp. And right. it's being told, it's a very realistic memoir um, as he is talking and his, his dad is both annoying and noble. And the story being told is horrifying. And it's all being told in this dead simple black and white uh, style with mice. With mice, and talking mice. Talking mice, and then the Nazis are cats, which sort of adds a whole layer of sort of symbolism that you really wouldn't get from uh, a textbook. Exactly. So, that's, right. that's why I asked you to point this out. It's because so, yeah. it's a mouse and nobody knows what it means. But when right. you realize that mouse is I a comic book series about 
the Holocaust and concentration camps uh, during World War II told with talking animals and cats, what what do you And see it's not in the least funny. I mean, it's harrowing no. to no, read. it's harrowing. So, so it's a comic book, but it's nothing that people would imagine from a comic book. What do you think the value is of telling that story with talking mice and cats in a comic book form instead of just writing a literary textbook of some kind about the experience right. from the point of view of real people? What is gained by doing it that way? Well, and, and this actually points back to the fantasy as well, because what's gained is there's, there's a lot of theory about how, um, how we read and how we look at pictures. And um, there's a lot of science that goes into this, which you know I'm certainly not qualified to talk uh, too articulately about. But, um, but there's, uh, the comic book allows, by slightly abstracting the figures, it becomes actually counterintuitively easier to inhabit them. So uh, when we're children, we read Peter Rabbit, um, and Peter Rabbit is more accessible to us than some story about a child having similar adventures. Because Peter Rabbit, we look at the picture of the child and we're like, that's not me. I know that's not me. But we look at the picture of Peter Rabbit and we're like, well, that's certainly not me, but it's not even pretending to be me. So I can imagine myself in that. I'm not a rabbit, so therefore I can imagine being a rabbit. I have a harder time imagining being a different little girl um, than I do imagining being too a rabbit. Close so, to, and perhaps right. in some cases, like, like Mouse's case, perhaps too threatening. Um, right. It's a part of why Mouse works so effectively is that the story being told is so hard. There's also a lot of stuff about the mechanics of how the comic book page works, um, which we're not going to go into, and about how information is brought on board through the eyes, through the different, two different streams of information operating simultaneously. Um, uh, so, so it's relevant, but it's like that's a whole different and fascinating conversation. But in fantasy, in these comic books, there Sim is there is a kind of excess increased accessibility to a lot of topics that comes with that distance right that is set up by setting them not in the real but in the imagined right because we can um, we can set it up in such a way that we can make it do what we need it to a, a realist story about something a trauma let's say a death of a parent a realist story. Uh, I may read that and I may see some of my experiences reflected in that, but it's not me. I may empathize, but I, I'm not going to, it's not going to operate on all the levels. It's something that invites me all the way in does. So if reading about a parent dying and I don't have a dead parent, then I'm like, well, I don't have a parent dead. What will it be like to lose my parent? That's all very interesting and difficult stuff to think about. Or if I have lost a parent, well, that's not what my experience was. Um, in a fantasy, I can build a relationship. Um, I can build a culture where there is a relationship that is um, alien and yet deeply profound in such a way that I personally, Kish Johnson, have never had that experience. Nobody has had that experience. But that experience can be made universal to everybody. Um, because none of us will ever have a symbiote who lives inside our head. And then when they are taken away from us, we go mad for a year. None of us will have that. But we all will have an experience like that. Not all of us are... It touches on that. On right. some aspect of that somehow. Right. And so it even, because, though it, even though it's not any of our actual experience, it speaks to so many of our experiences. Right. Partly because it's not specific enough to only speak to this narrow little slice. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had conversations with people before where, you know, talking about like uh, a literature where somebody dies, you know, like death of a parent. And they'll say, well, my dad was an asshole. <laughs> You know, it's like they will not read that story the same way because they will not, un even if they, no matter how good that author is, that author has lost that reader. Um, over here because on that's, fantasy. Because, because that's not my story. And because in that's on my fiction, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, yeah. It's supposed to be as close to reality, failing to understand that there are as many realities yeah, as there are people. Right. right, right, right. 
So going back to is fantasy all the same and Farrah Mendelssohn's oh, various yeah. categories, besides the tremendous difference in quality, and people need to realize that good quality in fantasy is reliant upon the same things that good quality is in any other form of literature. If it's really about something that matters to people and that people are going through and caring about, it'll be good literature. And if it's really about the props, the toolbox, it'll probably be bad literature. But that isn't determined, as you said, about comic books by the container. It's determined by what's it, contained in the What container. you put inside of it. You know, a bad story is a bad story. You know, bad mm -hmm. characters are bad characters and it doesn't matter what genre you're working doesn't matter in. whether it's in a comic book or a literary novel. Yeah. And a good story a is movie. a good story, whether it's in a literary novel, a comic book, a computer mm -hmm. game, a graphic novel or a movie or a television program. If exactly. it's a good story, it's still a good story. Yeah, yeah, that is exactly true. So, uh, um, but it's, yeah, let's talk just a little bit about Farrah Mendelssohn's uh, distinctions. First, um, because tell us I, who Farrah Mendelssohn is, because nobody I was about knows. to. I was about to. Farrah Mendelssohn is a fantasy theorist. She's an English uh, um, writer who uh, has written some really, really interesting books about the nature and rhetoric of fantasy. What is the what are the rhetorical elements, the, the tools of fantasy? She wrote a really good book, Rhetorics of Fantasy, that starts out by um, saying that there are not one kind of fantasy, but four. And I think often when people who are not fantasy readers talk about fantasy, they think, they think fantasy is one thing, and then there's a lot of stuff that isn't fantasy, um, which but it technically does fit the definition that fantasy is a real literature, it's literatures of things that can't happen. So she breaks it into four categories. Fourth category, because the, the last category in a pool like this is always everything that doesn't fit into my previous categories. So that's category four. We'll get to that in a minute though. But um, the first category is what she calls the portal. Um, story. And a portal story is we are starting here in our world and we move into an alien world, into a foreign world, into a fantasy world. Um, these, a portal story, uh, Narnia is maybe the best known of the portal stories. We start here and we walk through a wardrobe and now we find ourselves in Mar Narnia. Um, there are plenty of others and actually portals operate in mainstream stories a lot because a portal is every time you have a character saying, um, I'm, I'm a small town Iowa girl moving to New York. I have now gone through a portal into a strange world where the people are not like me, where things happen I never thought were possible. It's just like a fantasy, actually. Um, the second category is uh, what you would call secondary world. Um, secondary world fantasies are, are, there's our world. A secondary world fantasy is a world that takes, a story that takes place in a world that isn't ours but is fully fleshed. The characters don't come from our world to that world. The characters, uh, um, what happens is that uh, it's, we start there, we live there, we die there. It has no connection to ours. And the best known of these is Lord of the Rings because Middle Earth is a place that maps, you know, depending on how deep you go into it, maps into our, you know, you know England, our past, but it, doesn't really. You can't get from here to there. Game of Thrones is another very good example of that. Um, the third kind of story, I misspoke, there are five actually. The third is what they call the intrusion fantasy. And this is the notion that we're here having our lives in this world, the real world, the realist world, and they come in to invade our space. Um, funny how these, so many of these are sort of colonial narratives. They invade our space. They might be the vampires. They might be zombies. They might be a rift opens and demons pour through it. Um, but the intrusion fantasy generally is uh, us, people in our world being overwhelmed by, you know, by outsiders who are taking our stuff. Would, Very would cool. ghosts would ghost stories like haunting stories or things be included in intrusion fantasies? They or? actually fit into the fourth category. Ah, okay then. Which is called the liminal fantasy. The liminal fantasy um, from the word basically to do with, you know, the edges, the margins. Um, a liminal fantasy says that 
We are existing here and there is something that exists beside us that's ghosts. There are things that, that are part of our world that we are not aware of. Um, that, and uh, many, many, many literary fantasy writers write liminal fantasies. There's a genre called slipstream that is almost entirely this. And slipstream is where literary writers go when they want to write fantasy, but they don't want to admit that they're writing it. So the liminal fantasy, um, and you can kind of see that a liminal, you know, werewolves living among us might be liminal, but werewolves, uh, you know, coming into our space and killing us off and creating a werewolf super nation, that would be a, more of an intrusion fantasy. Mm -hmm. So Science that was fiction four. is full of these two. Five right. is category of everything else. Really? <laughs> that's the category? I, I guess that's <laughs> needed when you're operating in a completely inventive, creative, generative space. You're going to exactly. generate things that are new and therefore don't fit into what already exists. So, mm -hmm. great. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we have made passing references to people who want to write fantasy but don't, you know, serious writers who don't want to be caught writing fantasy. Um, I know that Virginia Woolf and Updike and people like that have actually written fantasy, just balls out. Even the, ones, the, even the ones who hate, who said fantasy is hack work would write fantasy. That's right. Yes, can you, yes. Can, you think of, can you think of some other examples of people that we think of as literary writers oh, yeah. writing fantasy? Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. Beloved is a ghost story. Um, you see, uh, Paul Thoreau wrote something called The Ozone, which has got speculative elements. Hilary Mantel. Um, it, gets, it gets even more confusing because there are an awful lot of stories with sort of a strange, mysterious undertone where you're like, um, for instance, Hilary Mantel wrote something called Flood. Um, and stories where you're like, is this real or is this not? Is this just where it could be taken either way? These are generally liminal stories. Um, but uh, I actually wrote down a couple of other ones and then I lost it. Well, while, um, you, while you look for them, I'll talk at you uh, in this same yeah. vein. Uh, in, addition, in addition to you know, straight on literary writers who have managed to sneak under the, the tent flap with some fantasy now and then without being caught, uh, there are also straight out fantasy writers who are somehow seen as and sold as literary writers. People like Anne Rice, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, Michael Crichton. You will not find their books in the fantasy section at any well, bookstore. That's... You will find them in the literary fiction section, even though right. they're writing about vampires and monsters and ghosts and spiritual magical realities. What, what is that about? When I, would, I worked in bookstores in my 20s, and I loved this because that's when I started writing fantasy and science fiction. And um, uh, the top 10 books in mainstream fiction, you know, the, the top 10 novels as opposed to sci-fi over here, um, they would be eight out of 10 would be some form of irreal literature. They'd be fantasy, science fiction, or supernatural horror. Um, they would be incontestably so. Uh, they unapologetically so. So this is why the marketing categories um, are also not a great way to identify yeah. your genres. Because right. if S Stephen King started as a genre writer, but became so big, he be moved over into mainstream. Right. Um, Paul Thoreau, when he wrote The Ozone, it was not shelved where it should have been in science fiction, um, where it would have found an audience. And so it was not one of his more successful books. And then, of course, it works the other way. Maria Doria, uh, Marie Doria Russell, uh, who wrote um, The Sparrow. The Sparrow and the, that whole series, The Children of God and, and all of that. She tried to publish that as science fiction. And because it, can, it, because it revolved around a plot involving the Jesuits and the Catholic religion and all the rest of this, they just wouldn't publish it. So she ended up going to literary fiction and the books became blockbusters. I mean, they're mm -hmm. very, they are profoundly moving and great literature. They, they tell a very deep story that's very thought provoking and very relevant to real lives in the real world. But it's still all happening on an alien planet with alien races and you know, all the rest of this. And when it became a blockbuster, 
science fiction publishers and fans screamed, well, what kind of snob are you not to come to us with that? And she said, hey, I tried, you wouldn't have me. So, uh, you know, th these, I'm speaking to these prejudices because mm -hmm. when you say fantasy literature, people think they know what you mean. And I'm mm -hmm. really encouraging people in the audience right now to look again before they assume that what they imagine when you say fantasy literature is actually what's out there. I also want to say there is a reading list on the library website of recommended titles, including a few of Kidge's. Uh, and I am one of the curators of that list. And I worked really hard to make sure that there wasn't much, if any, toolbox literature on that list. That is mostly really lovely literature that addresses the same themes just as powerfully as the best of literary fiction does, except well, within the fantasy space. Right, but I do want to just clarify, there's nothing wrong with the toolbox. Um, I didn't make that clear earlier because you were saying, there's nothing wrong, you can write a brilliant story that only is fantasy insofar as it has elves in it. Um, and it, it's not a bad story. It's, right. it's just a story where you have purposely chosen to treat um, the tools of fantasy like a sandbox. What and I meant when I made those remarks, and thank you for pointing this out, because it's a very good yeah. point. I'm not trying to vilify the toolbox, but what I was saying, what I have said on a few occasions during this conversation basically is meant to suggest the toolbox has many really profound values to a good fantasy story, but stories that are about nothing but the toolbox are not right. likely to be good stories. Right. So there are stories that are about nothing but the toolbox. I'm just going to write a story that has as many of these props crammed into it as possible in as flashy a manner as possible. And people will love it because of all the nifty props. That and there's, yeah. Yeah. That, and there's that's a lot, what I'm steering away from. Yeah, there's a lot of very successful and I think, and good young adult fiction that, that treats its fantasy or science fiction as a toolbox. It doesn't necessarily go into really thinking through the economics of its fantasy world because that's not what their priority is. It's still right. successful, it still works as a story. If you're there because you want realist, realistic world building in an alien world, you're not gonna get that, but it may still be very satisfying. So we have one more question before we get to the Q&A portion of this evening, um, which I hope people we've will- already, We've already sort of answered this question. Well, we have sort of, but I wanna give us, give us a chance to embellish on it if there's any embellishments needed. This last question basically is about the value of fantasy fiction for real people in the real world. So we've said quite a bit about this, but. Are there any things about fantasy fiction that you think are particularly and uniquely valuable in terms of the literature's application mm -hmm. to real people and we're leading real lives in the real world? Yes, absolutely. Because one of the things we can do that nobody except sometimes science fiction can do is that we can literalize metaphors. Uh, we can, uh, for instance, if you wanna talk about um, uh, uh, more than two genders. We can build a world with seven genders and say, what do you learn about love? What do you learn about affinities? What do you learn about identity? Once you've done that, you, um, you can't do that in a realist story. No, you you can only write a story about, the pe about people. Um, but I can create an alien, or I can create, my elves can have five genders and, you know, seven forms of marriage. And I can explore so many things if I go to that place. And in a fantasy world, I can, I can imagine a world where, where there's, there's uh, no, no uh, inequities. What does that look like? We cannot actually write that story in this world. We cannot write a story without inequity built into its matrix. But I can write that story and by trying it, looking at what the world would look like without that, I can maybe offer some ways for other people to see outside of the box of our, our reality. So this gets back to the concept briefly touched on earlier of thought experiment and the value of thought experiments. And the ironic thing is that this thing you're talking about right now is the same way that a great deal of experimental science. This is science. This, this is development and research where you create a completely artificial 
set of circumstances to isolate elements and get them to behave in ways that you could never observe in the real world so that once you learn what there is to learn from that observation, you can start applying it to all kinds exactly. of technologies and things in the real world. This is where things like quantum entanglement and the future of computing and mm -hmm. long distance communication happen is in this artificially constructed, completely right. unreal environment. But fantasy, which is not about technology, no. but, the same, but the same thing happens. Yeah. Um, we, we build these experiments um, on the science fiction side. We joke about this. We say we do the, all the same work a scientist does, but when the scientist sets out to do the lab or to do the experiment, we write a story, um, right. which is our experiment. Um, you know, is it reproducible? No, it's, we, are, we, are, we are engaging in a mode of inquiry that is unlike the scientific method but it serves some of the same purposes. And with fantasy, we're doing this with the heart, with the soul, with, yeah. with what identity is, with what, you know, what, what uh, is possible for the individual, right. what is possible for the group. So Ways we do all that to work. the interior experience of being yes. human. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I get, I would say that's probably a pretty good, um, uh, a pretty good way to say it, actually. <laughs> Yeah. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Well, okay. So we'll leave that one there. I, I also just want to introduce the idea that with things like fantasy fiction, you are able not only to change the world, but to simplify the world in ways that clarify it, in ways mm -hmm. that would not be tolerable in a realistic literary novel. A mm -hmm. literary novel has to look and feel enough like the real complexity and nuance of the real world that it's also going to obscure things that right. you could make far less obscure right. in a fantasy novel that didn't have to look in every respect like the real world. So that's mm -hmm. another facet of this same, you know, yeah. thought experiment, research and development kind of uh, virtue of, of imaginative fantasy fiction of this sort. Definitely, so, yeah. Is there anything else that you didn't get to really say before we start opening up to questions here. No, I'm sure people will ask questions that, that will, will bring those up. And no, this was really, really an interesting conversation. I'm so glad that you asked me to, you know, come have this conversation with you. Well, so thank and you. I am so glad that you were able and willing to do so. We're very fortunate. So um, we're going to, we're going to open up things now to Q and A. Mary, do you want to say anything about how this is going to work? Um, so uh, we are going to open up questions and answers um, to uh, Kidge or even Mark, um, because I found the conversation between the two of them was really very interesting. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is with raising your hand. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, a real easy way to put the icon to raise your hand to ask a question um, is to use the alt y keys and um, then we will call on you and you'll have your opportunity to ask questions. So um, I will open that up to the floor now. Be sure and uh, remember to unmute your uh, microphones when um, you're called on. Mary, um, when they raise their hands digitally, who is going to call on them? You or me or kids? Who? Um, I will be calling on them uh, to ask their questions. Okay, great. So when you raise your hands, Mary will be calling on you. I will be right. calling on you, yes. <laughs> so we can open it up now. Who has a question? Well, let's all jump in at once here. <laughs> I know you're out there. I can hear you breathing. Uh -huh. oh, wait. No, I, I see your names. Mm -hmm. I know who you are. Hi, yeah. everybody. Anybody so, got questions? Any Questions? Um, okay, so we have Steve who has a question. Go ahead, Steve. For, for your inspiration, um, you take your inspiration, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from a lot of the folklore of various cultures and from various places. Describe uh, to me what, what your ahead. inspiration is. Um, you decide that you're going to write something. For, for example, for me, when I decide to write, it's usually because someone has said something and it evokes an emotional response and I now have to go write. And when I do, it's easy to write. When I <laughs> sit down and just start writing with a blank slate, my thoughts are fractured or fractaled. 
and I can go in so many different directions, it's hard for me to focus. Describe how it works for you, if you would. That's, a, um, that's an interesting question because I don't think of myself as writing particularly um, rooted in folklore anymore, but of course that, that's fundamental to a lot of what I do. Um, my process usually, um, usually there's a, uh, something, something resonates for me, an image sometimes, um, sometimes a feeling that I'm trying to, like uh, music will do this, I'll, I'll have a feeling from a piece of music that elicits something. Um, and it's never easy. I'm not an easy writer. Um, I'm teaching a workshop right now, and I've been writing 600 words a day, even though this is my job for these weeks is to write with these people. And that's as good as it gets. I mean, 600 words is, is I have dragged them out of me word by word for that. But my inspirations recently um, have been, uh, it changes all the time, but uh, the last few years I've been very interested in sort of engaging with works that mattered to me when I was younger, but hadn't, which is kind of like folklore actually, but um, which I found there weren't easy access points for me. Um, so uh, um, H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer, I wrote, I sort of wrote a story engaging with that. Um, uh, Kenneth Graham, who wrote the children's book, The Wind in the Willows, I wrote a book engaging with that. So I've been doing that a lot, actually. So how do, you, how do you engage with books like that? With Wind in the Willows, what does that mean that you engaged with that? What did you do with Wind in Willows? How was that well, involved in your story? Much as I, I loved Wind in the Willows when I was a kid. And if you haven't read it, it's... Um, four friends, four male friends who are all animals living in England, having cute animal adventures. And uh, that's a really simplistic way to describe it. It's actually far more charming than that and actually more profound. It's bittersweet and has these beautiful, some of the most beautiful nature writing I've ever read. And I'm a big nature writing buff. But um, I, much as I loved that book, they were all boy animals. And I thought, well, what if you put a girl animal in there? And the answer was, you can't put one girl animal in there because this is Edwardian England. One girl animal has to have a friend or has to be married or has to have siblings. So then I had two girl animals and I had to figure out, I couldn't give them the same kinds of adventures because girls would not have the same kinds of adventures. But I wasn't really interested in writing, you know, a bunch of sort of drippy female animals, you know, tatting and you know, going to luncheon parties or anything. So I figured out what kinds of adventures would be accessible if you were a well-dressed property-owning animal in 1913 England. Um, and that's, that's how I did it, was that I inserted two female animals who move into a cabin and, um, and disrupt the neighborhood because nobody wants girls there, and then just sort of let it ride. <laughs> So this story of yours ended up not being about several cute animals having cute animal adventures, or at least not just about that. It ended up being about gender dynamics and politics during the Edwardian age. In other yes. words, it was a story about human experience being explored through the exotic lens of talking animals and their lives in nature. Like exactly. what we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Yeah. And because they were animals and not people, I, I was somewhat freed from the constraints there would have been. If I told a story about two uh, you know, female friends who moved to London in 1913 and they're going to have adventures, um, it would be quite a different story because they would be individuals. They would have the things that mattered to them would be specific to them. And because they were human, there would be different sort of expectations of them. Um, and I was so relieved not to have to do that right. because then I could really roll in on my characters are like super interesting. Um, Beryl, who's one of the two females, she knows how to do everything because she's a lady novelist. And so a good novelist learns how to do what she writes about. So she knows how to shoot guns and she knows how to hogtie rustlers and she knows all of the things that any writer who had infinite time would just pine to know how to do. So I created a girl, a female animal, that is 
somebody I'd really want to be, and I would have had a hard time creating a female human in 1913 England that I would want to be. So again, placing that extra layer of distance between real life and your story, you have actually created the opportunity for additional access to a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So this is kind of your, your process there is illustrating things we've talked about. We have mm -hmm. a question here that somebody wrote in ahead of time. Um, actually, they wrote two questions. The first one is about your process, your routine, the number of words per day and things. And you've oh. already really answered that question. Uh, but the second question was, how much is your work indebted to Ursula K. Le Guin? How similar or different are you as authors? So what do you, what do you think about that? Um, she's, she is one of the greats and I'm always incredibly honored when, you know, I, I, whenever I'm compared to her, which happens once in a while. Um, and I'm, I feel really, really fortunate that I was able to study with her because she was a fantastic teacher. She was so pragmatic, so calm. She just took no bullshit. I loved her. Um, the, I don't, that said, I feel like, I mean, I, I have a lot of styles and only one or two of them, you know, come anything close to the kinds of things she did. She had this just beautiful lambent style, this just clarity, this pure simplicity, which was not, it wasn't like Hemingway, although again, you know, fairly limited vocabulary and syntax, but nevertheless, she was using a, a very restrictive, toolbox to create these amazing things. And I mean, by toolbox, I mean, in this case, you know, her, her choices of voice and language, syntax and, and grammar and all the rest of it. So she's, uh, um, and I, lately I've been kind of a maximalist. So more recently I've been writing things that are all about the subordinate clause. Um, I am feeling the urge to go back to write something that's very, very crisp and clean again. Um, and when I do, I will probably go back and reread her short fiction. Um, we are similar in that we both, uh, uh, she wrote a lot about, um, or she, she wrote with great sensitivity about, uh, the, about animal intelligences. Um, she was really bold about, you know, thinking in terms of what, uh, of the humanity, you know, with the different you know, the humanity of the inhuman, I guess, you know, the, the, uh, the personhood of things that were not people. And right. I always really admired that. And that is a topic that I go back to a lot. And again, it's a topic that is being, uh, that is rising up again in the real world as well. There's more and more debate about the sentience of the other live forms we share the planet with and, mm -hmm. and whether they're really as oblivious and as brainless and as soulless as we have imagined them and more and more scientific research is suggesting no no in fact they're not um in fact didn't new zealand just declare all animal life sentient or something recently i mean i think there, there was is something, something yeah people there are something legislative in new zealand that kind of acknowledges yeah animals are people too i mean i'm saying that that's not what they said and i'm not entirely I'm not trying to apply that across the board, but the idea that animals are not just animals to be kicked around. Mary, I see yeah. you there. Yes. Have you got another question? Um, well, I have one for myself, and that was, um, Kidge, on your uh, short story, The Ponies, what was the inspiration of that one? That that was such a, a, a middle school um, a girl club kind of uh, uh, atmosphere in in that story where where did what's the background of that one um there are two people who are at this uh talk who know this story <laughs> i wrote that um uh for a friend actually barbara my friend barbara webb who i'm teaching a workshop with right now um and that's a story that started with a conceit because i needed a story idea and i said i need a story idea and she said write me a story about magical talking ponies um, and so I, because I was writing this for a rather dark woman with a very dry sense of humor, um, and she had required magical talking ponies, I, it just seemed really natural that we would go to this, this really uncomfortable place where um, ponies are tor tortured by their, their 
pre-adolescent kid, you know, owners. I personally, my personal part of the story is that I, I had a really hard childhood as far as that went. Nine to 11 was terrible for me. And I remembered it being almost that horrible, although there were no ponies involved. And so I was trying to kind of convey that as economically as I could, um, that, that sense, because, and this is something that couldn't have been told in a real story, because there are plenty of good middle school, middle school readers that are about, you know, girl bu bully, bullying. Mm -hmm. But um, that story, because it's about their ponies involved, because it's all somewhat symbolic, it has enormous resonance with it all of the little girls who read it um, and many, many little boys as well. And not so little actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, a fantasy story about ponies is not actually about ponies. It's not at all about ponies actually. Right. No, 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 it's not about ponies <laughs> at all. Yes. Any more than good fantasy literature is usually really about elves or dragons or any of those mm -hmm. other things. Those are simply vehicles to explore issues mm -hmm of more relevance than some would expect from such inventive stories. Yep, so any other questions do we have? Um, open this up, any questions at all for Kij or for Mark? And if we, um, if we don't, we might uh, uh, say thank you to uh, our guests and um, close this out if there are no other questions. Lisa, I'm about to text you. <laughs> hey, Lisa. I'll text yeah. you as soon as I get off the phone or off the call. So, <laughs> yeah. okay. Kids, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. It was Kansas. a pleasure. It was a great yeah. conversation. I appreciate yeah. that.